So good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's session, uh, top guest photographer session with John Nazari. John, I know I have you waiting in the wings. Good evening. How are you doing? Very well. Lovely to be here. You can get a bit closer to your microphone now, mate, if you like. Okay. How's that? P perfect. That perfect, pal. Can hear you nice and clear. So, John, before we get started, obviously, let's just uh, quickly just tell everybody about about yourself if they're not familiar with you and what you do and how you've got to where you are. Um. Well, first of all, it's wonderful to be here, and thanks for inviting me. And uh, it was interesting when you asked me to, to do a talk. It really made me think about what to talk about. Um, and yeah, I've been—I realised I've, I've been practicing, been a practicing photographer now for 25 years. So I graduated um, in 1991 um, from a photography H and D, and I consider that my first starting point as a sort of professional. Um, Although my, my beginning of photography came when I was 13, so my stepfather uh, gave me a Zenith EM, which was his own camera for my 13th birthday. Um, and he had this wonderful way of describing how it worked in the relationship between the shutter and the aperture. Um, and the mechanical, obviously it was a mechanical camera, and I just understood it. There was something about the way he described it which just made sense to me. And I obviously it was back in you know, 1983, it was film days. And, um, I was shooting, started shooting a role, uh, maybe every every month or so, and it'd come back in a post, and there'd be an, an image out of out of a pack of 24, 36 that my mum would look at, and she'd be intrigued by, you know, why did you sh shoot that shadow? Why have you done a shot of that leaf or so on? And uh, I I just wasn't sure why I was I was intrigued by shape and textures and, and things like this, but I just continued a lot, and it, and I found that by 15 I was really clearly wanted to be a photographer. I had a dark room at 15, I joined the local camera club and I started winning the local competitions at the camera club and at 16 I left school and went and did a national diploma in photography at Watford College um, and that experience really focused me into studio interest so by the time I'd finished my ND um, I was 18 and I thought I want to do advertising. So I left there and I went and did a HND at what's now called the University of Arts which was then called Medway College, which was a perfect course for me. It's still a great course, actually. Um, it's now a degree. When I did it, it was a two-year program, but it's very technical. So it was it was this kind of ongoing instruction into light and uh, studio practice. Um, and although there were some contextual studies and theoretical sessions, uh, it was really 75% practice, 25% theory, and it was totally what I needed and wanted. So when I graduated, in 91, I wanted to photograph objects. I had photographed still life um, for, at that point, four years at college. And of course, I'd done people as well. But I really knew that I wanted to be an advertising photographer working in still life. Um, and a lot of the work I came out, I came out with a focus portfolio, which was five by four. Um, and then obviously in 91, when I went out on my own, um, I worked a, with photographers. In the old days, you would then go and assist someone and they would, you would learn even more, obviously, from them, and then you have access to a 10-8 because of college. We didn't have 10-8s, we had 5-4. So my portfolio was a 5-4 book. Um, and then quickly, within the next couple of years, it became a lot of 10-8 photography as I was shooting and testing um, and doing the odd job for myself, but they, were, they, were, they weren't that many. In those days, you'd, you know, you'd be learning a lot, and, but not, not doing many jobs you know, because you'd be, you'd be um, assisting and so on. Um, so I was interested in objects, interested in, in objects rather than people, and interested in light. Um, and here, and I had this kind of interest in making things look different. So taking the everyday objects, taking kind of arbitrary objects, and then turning them or transforming them into something else through kind of a close observation. And I was obviously I was into the tone off, so to, tones of tones a lot. So you got a light from the left here, and then a light from a, from the right, creating this kind of juxtaposition of... Um, John, John, I think you've got ahead of yourself. I think you've forgotten that uh, we haven't handed you the screen over yet and you're getting into the... Perfect. Okay, so the first slide is a, uh, a text slide here which, which outlines this period. So I've tried to put my talk into sort of sections of years. So I'm starting in 91 when I first graduated, um, interested in still life and advertising. And this first section is the work that I produced in those, in those early years. So the first picture is coming up. There it is. Um, oh, okay. Let that settle. So it's a football. Um, so I was very interested in taking everyday objects, which I was just just saying, um, 
and turning them into or transforming them into sort of new meanings and so on. I mean, it's quite playful, but I was trying to make it look, look a, a bit like a planet. And uh, a lot of the work I was I was doing was a kind of very kind of influenced by 80s advertising. So there's, there's this sort of tone offs, you know. So I've got this kind of light coming in from the left sort of fading away into the dark and then opposite light on the right in the background and so on. So, you know, you're talking like flash photography, um, big perspex screens, um, multiple flashes, uh, 10 by 8. This, is, uh, this was actually a 5 by 4 uh, transparency, uh, but a lot large format photography. I'll flick through them. And I had this um, interest as transforming objects, as wrapping them. I, you know, I was... I would wrap blades, I would wrap teapots and teacups and irons and things like this and just see what they'd look like and then study them and photograph them and um, create kind of a tight portfolio which was, uh, although you know there's a lot of food photographers at the time that were doing very kind of um, tight close stuff like this with this sort of warm light um, and, and many well-known photographers I was really interested in in the late 80s and early 90s that uh, had this approach which I was sort of um, you know for following. Uh, so you kind of very, very advertising, and, I, and this is actually work I've never shown before. So I was delighted to get it out and have a look at it. I haven't really looked at it in 20 years. Um, dug it out of my portfolio, done some scans and so on uh, to get it onto my PowerPoint, um, and had some fun looking at it all and trying to choose which ones I wanted to show to give a sense of what, where I started. Um, this was a 10 by 8 transparency. Uh, I remember. I was uh, I was in Watford and I, I passed this sh closed shop and I saw this vase with these flowers sticking out and I went in and spoke to the manager and said this is 1991 I think and I said you know I really like the vase of flowers there can I borrow it and they were a bit taken aback and I explained what I wanted to do and I said I give them a frame picture and they they let me I mean I don't know whether these things would happen today like that and you go into a closed shop and they just let you take something away like that but they did. And then I uh, went and shot it and came back and brought it back for them and bought, bought a frame picture. Um, so I then, I then placed the backgrounds in and lay, you know, changed maybe the shape of the, the ties and so on, lit it. Um, and then I had a backlight coming in with that kind of yellow light coming in. So I kind of created a gap between the two, the two backgrounds. And then I had a, a light sneaking in at the background to kind of give us a sense of um, layering to the behind, behind the flower. Um, the, flower as well, the ties, supposed to look like flowers. And here's an, another example of something wrapped, this was um, this was an iron, this I wrapped in black silk, um, which, you know, it becomes quite sort of like phallic maybe, or like a missile or a, um, a bullet or something like this. And, uh, and, and this brought a smile to me when I found this in my portfolio, this is, I, saw, I actually shot this in 1990, in my last year at uh, college, and this, this, but what struck me about this when I found it was that I mean at the time I was absolutely delighted with this, this, this shot and the experience of it. Uh, this is a f obviously five by four. You can see it in the scan. I've kind of left a bit so you can see it was shot on Kodak. And, um, and uh, when I shot this, I shot it in the woods. And back in those days, I, you know, to do something like this, you need, uh, you needed, I needed a generator. So I hired a generator. Um, I then ran my redheads off the generator and it had an extension running behind the back trees in the dark which would then connect to a smoke machine which was stuck behind my friend James who was dressed as a Grim Reaper and I put the smoke machine behind him and it was, as I remember very vividly, I mean it was, uh, it was a 90 second exposure and uh, James would just stand there freezing cold as still as he could and uh, I took this picture, and and obviously everything on those days were all in, was all in camera, you know, there was no sort of you know post retouching and so on. And of course, there were retouchers and very brilliant retouchers back then, and but they would they would paint, so they would take um, inks. So if there was a scratch or something that wasn't quite right, you could you could ask them, at, you know, at costs that sometimes were significant. Um, that would then they would like take out a tree or take out a branch, and they basically get a palette and get check, get the right colour. That they were trying to replace and paint, literally paint over the transparency. Um, and I didn't do that here. This is just, this is as it was shot back in 25 years ago, 26 years ago. Um, just a couple more examples before we move on to um, phase two, which I wanted to, um, which is a big jump. So um, what happened was that I was I was doing advertising, and I was was very influenced by close-ups and light and objects 
and what you know developing this portfolio to work on my own. And I was working with this photographer, and we we would um, work with all sorts of products and all sorts of um, uh, different jobs. So the week was the weeks and months were really varied, and the sort of work would come in through the studio. And I had this one experience which changed my career. So on this particular day, the photographer said. We've got an unusual product we're coming in today. We're photographing a missile from the Ministry of Defence. And I was 22, uh, 1992, I think. And um, and I said, that's OK. Uh, and he said, well, I've got to go out to a meeting. Um, can you light it? Do a 10 by 8 Polaroid of it. And when I get back at lunchtime, we'll have a look together, and we'll take it on from there. This wasn't an unusual request. To, you know, I got to that point where I understood how he liked things lit and so on. and. Um, and I and I enjoyed that that responsibility as well to be able to to go and do some to, to do it for myself, you know, to get it ready for him to pick it up. He would always tighten it and improve it, but it was good for me, you know. So uh, the Ministry of Defence brought this missile in. It was obviously it was a it was a unarmed, it was dud, so whatever one calls it, but it was was you know was dangerous. They brought it in, and it was it was a big missile. It was eight foot. It was much taller than I was. I remember it vividly, very heavy, very wide, green, um, and we wheeled it in, and the Minister of Defence um, had a, well, there was military police there in the studio, I had to sign something, and they stayed with it, and I laid out a background colour, which we'd agree, I'd agree with the photographer, and then I lit it, and did a, a shot, and I thought, well, how do I like this? I thought, well, it looks like a bottle, so we're always shooting bottles, so I just kind of did a bigger version of that kind of light context, and and I lit it. I don't have the shot to show you, um, but the story is important for me because um, I remember this moment where I was um, cleaning it because I did the Polaroid and there was grease all over it. And I said to the the man who brought it in, the military police, you know, how do I clean this? And he didn't really didn't know. So I, I got a chamois leather out of the storeroom and started kind of cleaning this missile of the, the grease. And um, I remember this trail of thought that hit me with such force, which was, John, you're cleaning this missile so you can make it look good, so you can take a good photograph of it, so we can then sell that, obviously that image, to the Ministry of Police, so they can then put it at Ministry, Ministry of Defence, so they can then put it in a brochure, so then that brochure then goes to, to someone who will buy it, and that could that could be a state, probably a state, and then that, that could kill a person, could kill a village, and I remember this sudden thought, this context about images, photographs, and a wider context, and distribution of images and the impact of that, which I hadn't really considered at all with such force until that moment. And uh, I found myself becoming, after that, I began to become less interested in advertising um, and, and objects too. And, and I stopped taking photos. So I, after a, a, a few months, I actually left the job and I actually got an eye illness as well. So I, um, I, uh, I found that I... I the eye illness was quite bad, eye illness, I got iritis, which is kind of inflammation in my eyes, and I kind of always connected that relationship, so it seemed like a good exit point, because I wasn't well either, and I needed time to recover, and I always thought about the missile experience as being a turning point, because when I came back, I came back completely different, so after, so uh, once my eyes got better, I then began to think, I don't want to be photographing of objects like that anymore. I wasn't properly contextualizing the reason. I was just drawn to be interested in other things. And I um, I started uh, an MA in 1996 at, at uh, Middlesex University, where I studied what was then called um, visual culture. Well, in fact, my course was called Teaching Visual Culture. I thought I'd like to teach. And I had, had a bit of experience uh, after I left the advertising world of then teaching at uh, Watford College and teaching advertising and I, I started teaching how to light to students um, back at Watford where I did my ND and then back at Medway which then turned into the Kent Institute of Art and Design um, and, I, and I was sort of perfectly poised at that point to teach studio work um, and I really enjoyed it working with students that weren't that much younger than me uh, that saw that you know I'd kind of left and I'd come back within five six years and and I had a, a whole set of experiences of the industry and was helping them with, with a lot of practice-based stuff. Although at that point my theoretical knowledge was 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 you know was getting better but it wasn't where it became. Um, so from that point of about ninety six when I started my MA I became I became more interested in, in much more kind of cultural theory, critical theory, fine art practice, um, and my work changed. So for the next sort of eight years 
my I would began to consider I considered myself as an artist and my work completely changed. So this is the first change of here, which is a project that I called First Person, Second Generation at the time. It was an exhibition. It was um, exhibited in many places. Uh, I, th I lost count, maybe 15 to 20 galleries uh, over two years. I got a, a touring grant from the Arts Council and I showed it across the UK. I showed it in Cyprus. Um, I showed it uh, um, in Toronto as well, um, and it was a, a it was a photography exhibition about Greek Cypriot identity. So it, the project really explored the relationship between first generation migrants and second generation my Greek Cypriot migrants in London and their objects. So I was interested in the objects that the first generation brought with them on their journeys to the UK, and the second generation who were born here. What objects would they be interested in if they didn't make that journey and didn't? then bring objects with them, what objects in this kind of culture and this where they're brought into do they are they interested in? And I was did this sort of photographic study. And what was interesting for me was this kind of ejection of the 5.4 and a 10.8 and this is all shot on on black and white 35 mil, 400 ISO, 800 ISO, very grainy, you know, printed six foot. So it's kind of I really struggled when I was exhibiting it about the fact that it was just sort of all breaking up and so on completely different to what I'd been doing and what I'd uh, been trained to think about, um, really struggled with it. But because I've been at that point you know, immersed in my teaching and in my MA and all my readings and so on, that I was really moving into a different area um, and embraced it. So after this project, um, uh, just before I begin to talk to you about this, then uh, this is a project in 2006, but before that, so after 98, I then became interested in thinking, well, I'm interested in migration. That project was really interesting to me. And I began to sort of f focus more on this idea about identity and migration identity. As a Greek Cypriot myself, I was particularly interested in um, this, the Greek Cypriot um, experience. Um, and I then wanted to take it further. So I, I um, enrolled in a PhD at the University of, T of East London, where I began a, a PhD which was uh, titled my PhD thesis was uh, Greek Cypriot and Turkish Cypriot identity, I think. Oh my goodness, I can't remember what my PhD was about, what's my PhD title. Um, but the research was interested in first generation and second generation narratives. So, so the PhD moved from a photographic kind of sociology, which the MA was, to more of a narrative-based PhD. Um, so it was becoming a purely theoretical PhD, but alongside it, as an artist, I did produce a number of works. And I'm going to show you one here um, due, uh, called The Cyprus Problem. So while I was doing my research, I was in Cyprus doing interviews with Greek Cypriot and Turkish Cypriot refugees. And I was very interested in something that started to happen when I was interviewing people, which was that um, they talked about the Cyprus problem a lot. And the Cyprus problem, which is like a phrase like in Northern Ireland, you know, the, the, the phrase, the troubles. It was a phrase to describe the political problem. Um, particularly, obviously, the problem to do with, and, and to give you a slight quick background, um, Nicos Cyprus actually is still the only remaining um, capital in Europe, which is a divided city. So there's a, there's a UN patrolled line, although that, that line is actually, um, uh, it's is not so heightened, the, the, the issues around it, although it's a different sort of politics taking place, but people can now move across, um, more freely across, but for many years, from 1974, there was a, uh, a war uh, between Turkey. Uh, it's a complex story. I'm not going to go into it. So anyway, the Cyprus problem refers to this divided capital and the problem of land and ownership and integration and the conflict between Turkey and the Turkish Cypriot community and the Greek Cypriot community. Um, so whenever I was doing my research and I was interested in, in ordinary people's narratives about belonging and identity and home and so on, particular stories before the war as well. Um, people would talk about um, uh, the Cyprus problem as uh, the, the main political problem. And I began to notice the more I stayed in, in, in Cyprus doing research that there were other problems taking place in the country that really struck me. So there were sort of issues of women's rights, sexism, refugee rights, um, gay rights, uh, disability issues, m work, migrant workers' rights, and so on. And, and, I know, and in interviews, I'd say, well, I understand that the Cyprus problem is a the big problem, but there are other issues here. What about women's rights? And people would often say, "There's no time to discuss that. We are behind. We we understand we're behind on women's rights, but 
right now, in the, the biggest problem that this society needs to deal with is the political problem and the Cyprus problem. And it left me thinking about an art piece, which is what I call this. So this project um, is a set of stills that depict social problems um, to do with Cyprus, particularly the south side, the Greek Cypriot side, where I was doing my research. Um, and I felt a little bit more comfortable sort of exploring and, and one would say critiquing the Greek Cypriot side as a Greek Cypriot as well. Um, so I've depicted a number of what I, I suppose I'd call social issues and social problems. So this, this picture is referring to um, a sort of sexist, uh, sexism, uh, a very kind of common sort of uh, image that you might see on the street. I mean, I haven't been there for, for seven, eight years now. Um, this was done in 2004 when I shot it, and the exhibition was 2006, uh, so it's a long, long time ago. Um, and, and I decided to try and make these sort of almost stereotypical kind of moments as well. So a stereotypical kind of um, uh, image of a woman walking down the street, st an image of, a, of a, my friend here who's actually can't. This is the major post office in Nicosia, and at that point, he couldn't get in to the post office because of the stairs, there was no ramps. Um, this is an image of me, a self-portrait. I remember at the time I was speaking to this activist who said that, I think he said in 2003 there was a gay, there was a gay rights, but there was a petition for gay rights, and something like under 20 people in the country signed it. I couldn't, I was shocked by this. So, you know, one of the images explored that. Um, there was actually eight images here. Uh, the one on the left here. Um, is about uh, elderly and uh, this is a woman who's actually been in this house, it had a fire and she'd lived in this house for 20 years in this in this condition and on the right the images of migrant workers coming through um, the border to work in the, in the in, from the north side, the Turkey Cypriot side, coming in to work in the Greek Cypriot side um, and of course they're, they're not subject to rights, they're not, they're outside of the EU so they're exploited and there's a lot of issues going on which I wanted to explore in these images. So alongside trying to explore these social issues was this other level of kind of meaning, which was about the fact that I was in these images. Uh, I wanted to place myself in as a sort of observer, stroke kind of participant. You know, what kind of role do I have in these constructions, in these depictions? You know, am I, am I a witness? Am I a participant? Am I an active um, figure? You know, here I'm kind of a bystander walking by. In this one, I seem more active. You know, I'm kind of with man on, you know, this is my friend Leon, and, you know, I'm, I'm obviously, we're both sort of in our underpants, so there's much more kind of interaction and, and participation than, say, maybe this this one as well is playful, you know, am I am I looking at her, am I not, you know, so what's my role in these in these here, and the, the one on the right, I seem to be sort of taking names down, so I'm kind of involved more, so I'm trying to sort of explore lots of things here about my role in these pieces, and my role as an artist as well. Um, but also, there's another level taking place here, which is these were, um, well, I, I put a question actually to you today. I don't know if um, how quick answers could come back, but there's, there's some things wrong with some of these pictures. So we pause on this one. I don't know if anyone can see what's potentially wrong with this picture, something that stands out that's not quite right, that maybe hints at some sort of retouching that might have taken place. I wonder if anyone notices something that stands out with this picture. There, yeah, guys, if you spot anything, uh, there we go. Okay, so there's no shadows to the guys. Only yeah, the lady exactly. has a shadow. So, yeah, they, they picked it up quicker than I did, John. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this was a comp, and I begin to use this methodology in my work more and more. Um, so what I did here, so this is 2004, and I'd moved from film to digital at that point. It was my first introduction to digital around 2004, and I was really interested in the sort of, uh, possibility of of a digital world. I mean, it was a, it was a struggle. I remember the first year of moving to digital. I really struggled with that transition. I felt like I had to relearn it. It took like a year. I felt to really understand the limitations and the differences. Yes, the cameras looked the same and they did the same things, but the results were completely different. Um, and I really struggled to really come to terms with it. Um, uh, I'm actually gone back to film, so uh, only three months ago I've actually brought a 5x4 camera and I've started doing 5x4 personal port portraits for myself, but that's another story. Um, so at this point, I just entered into the digital world and I was really interested in the, in the possibilities. And of course, within the art context, there were a lot of artists you know, really playing on the kind of comping 
and uh, there was a there was a number of shows around that time, and and actually in the late 90s um, that really played on reproduction of the self and so on in, in imagery. So I kind of was taking a, an idea and turning it into something else as well. So it wasn't like something I invented at all. Um, but I wanted to leave hints of the problem, so this is why she has a shadow and the others don't. So sort of almost letting the viewer say something's not right, don't trust this. And it was really a problem I was having with the, with the idea of the documentary and the moment. So I wanted these kind of documentary moments, like they're court documentary moments, but at the same time to leave the viewer thinking that actually these are, these are highly mediated, highly constructed moments. And the fact that I'm in them says a lot to, in the first place, but then as you break down, and look at them, then they're not quite as they seem. So this is actually, uh, the picture of me is one picture, that's a self-portrait on a timer. Uh, the picture of the uh, the main female walking up the road, that was a separate image of her on her own. And then the the guys, in, in this actual picture, the two guys together by the curb, one holding a bottle, they, that was one picture. The two guys to the right on the table, that was another picture. The man in the blue vest and the yellow top was another picture and the other man on the far left with the glasses is another picture. So we've got really one, two, three, four, five, six pictures here comped together um, to make a moment. So that it, what I like to think about is, is this is a moment that happened, but it happened across time. It didn't happen in the frozen moment of the image. So it's an interesting way of thinking about it and the same here. So this moment didn't happen like this, it happened across time but brought into a con it was kind of brought to to the, brought in to become a moment. Um, now there's another. Obviously, this is this is a quite different thing because it's um, more of a stage portrait. But again, I'm leaving the viewer. I should. I'm hoping people spot this straight away. But there's another little thing here that should stand out. Something's not quite right. I don't know if anyone could see this as well. The Photoshop kind of um, trick. Uh, you might have them on this one, John. Well, I'm, really? thi I'm thinking about it as well. I can't, I, there's nothing jumping at me yet. Really? It's not a mirror. It's Well, it, it is a mirror. Okay. But that begs the question. Oh, there's no camera there's, in the mirror. There's no camera in it. Ah, yeah. good one. Yeah. So this was, um, this is two photos. So the first photo is of the table and of the mirror with the jeans hanging up. It's just Leon's jeans and his T-shirt and... Actually, it was his room. He's a friend of mine, a brilliant photographer, Leon Steele, and he. Um, uh, so he kind of we set this up together. This kind of narrative of the transient man, and we kind of placed down his flight tickets and stuff like that. And Leon was out in Cyprus helping me with with the project. And um, we, I then lit it. We and in, in the original image, there's a picture of me and Leon standing by the tripod, with the flash firing, with ourselves reflected in the mirror. And then I turned the camera around, a full. 180, and, and then pho photographed the bed, um, did on a timer, jumped down, sat down next to Leon, took the shot, did a number of tests on it, got the shot, and then it's basically just comped, it's just a cutout, so took the shot of us on the bed and cut it out and placed it into the mirror, um, and that's, that's as simple as it was for that picture. Okay, so, moving on. We're doing for time, we're doing fine. Um, so by by the late sort of mid 2000, I was doing my PhD, um, very interested in sort of refugee issues and and refugee art. Uh, you know, my work had been exploring Cypriot refugee issues um, and you know Cypriot and Cypriot political issues and so on. And two years later, I then embarked on a um, uh, another project which was about migration with uh, a, a photography colleague of mine and friend, Anya Dabroska. We had a joint exhibition at the Four Corners Gallery in East London, and it was a it was an exhibition about refugee identity, home, place, and objects. My research interest shifted from Cypriot um, refugees to Palestinian refugees, and I did some uh, photography field work in Lebanon um, in refugee camps, and again all digital photographing portraits of refugees. This is in Shabra Shatila refugee camp in Lebanon. Um, and then walking around um, the refugee camps photographing alleyways and objects and so on uh, with really intense portraits. So I was interested in these sort of really intense portraits and then fragments and objects as well. There's a couple of spreads from the book we had published, we had a book published by the Arts Council, funded by the Arts Council. So you can see my work started out in advertising then it shifted, moved to black and white photography, 
with a, with a kind of interest in migration, and then that, that carried on for, for many years, then moving into digital and carrying on this sort of um, interest in, in migration and portraiture um, and, art, and an art practice. I've described my, I was describing myself as an academic stroke artist at this stage um, of my career. Alongside all of this, I was still doing my personal work and doing my own portraiture um, as a photographer. Uh, and I've been lucky enough to have three images submitted uh, that have been accepted for the Taylor Wessing Photo Prize. The first picture, actually, um, actually, I'm going, I'm going back in time. So we start, we start with the newest one. So this was um, this was uh, exhibited at the uh, Taylor Wessing. Uh, photographic Portrait Prize 2013. It's called Number 61 East London. This was a photo of uh, neighbours who lived opposite me in East London, where I used to live in Stratford. And I remember I lived there. I moved there in 2002. So after 11 years, this family had been there for 11 years, and I'd watched them grow up. These kids were them born and growing up, and so on. And they'd all often be playing outside. And I remember coming home a lot from work and the kids would be playing outside and this image had really stayed in my mind and I wanted to shoot something for um, the NPG competition because I always do, I always submit and uh, I really enjoy bringing, you know, doing personal work and having something to focus on every year to, to do sort of personal work for the competition so that's one of the things I always enter and uh, I had this image in my mind so I kind of knocked on their door and I asked them if they'd be interested in a family portrait and when they came out uh, the first way I did it was to really kind of a more of a formal portrait where they're all sitting on the wall looking at me or standing looking at me um, and uh, the light was quite consistent and I had the camera on a tripod um, so I was I was open to where I'm going to end up comping so what we then did was I said well let's let's I liked it but it wasn't what it wasn't what I wanted it wasn't what I had in my mind which was them actually just doing what they normally do so I just said to them just forget me let me, why don't you just carry on like you normally would? Imagine I'm not here and just play in the street. And they did. And I took uh, probably about 100 pictures. And I, and I really enjoyed it. And they really enjoyed it too. And then I said goodbye. And then when I looked at it on the computer, um, I wasn't thinking I'm going to comp this, but I knew I could if I wanted to because nothing had moved. So they move. The building doesn't move. The camera doesn't move. So I was shot on a cable release, so I knew there wouldn't be, well, hopefully reduced movement there as well. And uh, and I was right. I was able to, and the light was consistent. So I wasn't worried about, I mean, I could maybe have got rid of shadows if bright shadows came in, but it gets more complicated if you get bright light on one person and the others are soft. So I was lucky with the light it was quite consistent. And then I, um, I, I was looking for the moment in one image, but I started to fine images where I like different fragments of it. So the two on the wall really stuck out as an image I liked and I like the kind of sort of imperfection of it, of the way she's sort of leaning and so on. You know, there's plenty more images where they might have looked but I mean, there's something really real about it which I really liked. So I remember sort of putting that aside thinking I might well, I'll work with that. But the rest of the image of that image I, I wasn't a big fan of. But then the kids on the bikes was another image and then the mum with the baby was another image and and the uh, dad was a, another image looking to the to his to his right. Um, so yeah, this became uh, a four. This just came, became a comp. Um, and uh, but again, you know, it's a documentary image, a street photography, but a comp. So there's a sort of you know you can see the influences from my earlier Cypress project, was moving into into new forms here. Um, and uh, I've never actually, I haven't really done that again. I mean, it's it's a, it's a method that's. That I've done and I and I can do, but um, it's not something I've tried out again in the last couple of years in my personal work. This was um, a photo that I took in 2006, and this again is my neighbour in the same street, and she actually lived next door, the white building on the right. She came and knocked on my door in 2006, and she um, was dressed up as Vicky Pollard from Little Britain, and she was, I think, she was about. 14 at the time, maybe 13, and she started doing an impression, um, and I knew her very well, and and I, I found it really funny, and I just said to her to stay there, and I got my camera, and um, I got my flash and photographed her, and uh, and I entered it, and and it got into the National Portrait Gallery, and I was delighted, and I mean one of the judges picked it out as her favourite picture, it was in the in the book, and it was discussed in the beginning as one of the highlights for her, 
and um, and I think there's a lot of um, a lot a lot of layers about this image. You know, the fact that she's she, she's got a pillow in her, in her under her top, so she's sort of uh, is she pregnant? Is she not? You know, what she's got a cigarette, but it's it's not lit. Is she pretending? Is it play acting? This sort of makeup that's really really quite badly done. You know, so what what is this picture about? Is it a sign of our times? Is it something else? Um, and uh, you know the kind of ambiguity girl dressed up. Is it is she is she dressing up or is she dressed up? And that's what she looks like. You know. Anyway, it captured the, the judge's imagination and it got in. And this was the first time I ever got in. So this was an image of my dad and me. I'm just going to pause, take some water. Hold on. Excuse me. So this is um, this is a self-portrait of my father and I. And I said to him that I wanted him to go to uh, a shop. I gave him some budget. I gave him, I think I gave him 50 pounds, um, and I said I want you to buy yourself an outfit and me an outfit. But I don't, I, I can't, you know, I can't remember how much I gave him. Um, and I must have been more than 50 pounds. Bought the shoes as well. So he, uh, I think he went to Burton's and he went to Clark's and he bought these. This really kind of really struck me. Um, uh, white t-shirts and these sort of beigey, you know, stay pressy sort of things. With, uh, with with these black heavy black shoes, and um, I uh, then did a self portrait, and I really sort of wanted this sort of ambivalence. The the picture was really about this sort of ambivalence about my father, about wanting to be like him, but also at the same time wanting to be different from him, um, and, the, and that kind of ambivalence that I was was aware of growing up, and uh, and about intimacy as well. So and he was really up for it, and and I don't think he quite understood. What the picture was about, but he was delighted, and we were both delighted. And we both went to the opening, and um, uh, and it was great that you know we both went to see the show, and, and he was he was on the wall, and and it was a lovely uh, moment actually. And and I think you know using photography to explore issues like this, personal issues. I think you know, I think it's um something that I've, I'll always be doing. Uh, it's a part of a way in which I might explore. And there's, I've got a lot of personal family portraiture coming up um, when I put the lens on them. And I and I I think there's actually a lot of lot of artists have done it, and um, I do get a, a lot of spot a kind of satisfaction out of exploring my family and, and myself and so on in my work. So, okay, so we're moving now to um, a shift in my digital um, equipment. So I was shooting Canon in 2004 to 2013, and by 2013. I had at the end of 2013, I had a, a full, fully kit DSLR. I had a massive Canon kit. I had, I had a 1DX. I had a 5D Mark III. I had a 1D Mark III, and I had a 1DS Mark III. So I had quite a lot of heavyweight Canon cameras. I had a 24L lens, 1.4, I think it was. I had a, a 50, 1.2. I had a 35 1.4, I think it is, beautiful lens. I had uh, an 85 1.2, beautiful portrait lens. I had a 135 um, f2, I think it was, um, and then all the flashes and so on. So I had all primes, all the best primes, and some fantastic bodies. And I had a break in. Uh, I was in a studio in Islington, and five guys, the CCTV cameras show five guys breaking into the studio. I was renting from Nick Mason, um, the drummer from Pink Floyd, and I was in their studio, their, their kind of old recording studio in Britannia Row, which was um, which Nick, had, as a landlord there, was was you know offering spaces for a lot of creatives, actually artists and architects and designers and so on. And I was sharing with a design agency, and we got broken into. And I was the main, main, the main person that really lost out um, on that breaking because my colleagues they lost a couple of computers, but I lost, I lost 36,000. I lost all my cameras, all my lenses, all my computers. They didn't take my data, but my, the network was backed up anyway, so the photos were fine and safe. Um, but they, I didn't even have a lens cap to my name, and I was borrowing and hiring, and the shoots that were coming up in the, in the meantime while we were waiting for the insurance, and then there was some quite scary moments with the insurance about, about claiming claiming it back. Um, when I got 26,000 back, I remember thinking, wow, I felt like, I felt sort of relieved. There was a sort of, sort of, um, 
experience of, of I was pleased. I was almost this point of this terrible experience had, had created this opening, which was, wow, I'm, I can start again. Um, and I remember thinking, what is the right camera for the right job? I had a feeling sometimes I was turning up with a 5,000 pound camera, Canon DSLR camera, taking a shot at an event which was going on the internet, low res. And I really felt that I was over-servicing um, a lot of jobs with this really heavyweight cameras that really didn't really need that kind of you know, power. And, um, and it was also I was getting back problems, quite bad ones, uh, to the point where I would be sometimes at the end of the shoot being unable to move even towards the end and I'm still sh working and I'd say to my colleagues on the shoot working with me and I can't go back out there for 10 minutes I need to stretch and my back's killing me um, because I'd always wear two you know one camera on the right side one on the left and having those heavy bodies so I um I heard about the Olympus EM1 uh, EM1 and uh, it hadn't come out yet and I was in that period where I just got my check and it was November 2013 and the camera was coming out in December and I managed to speak to um, Olympus and get a day with it before it came out and I, I bought a card and tested it all and then took the card home and then I put it on my computer and I analysed it intently and I really wanted it to work. Um, I knew it would mean relearning um, and there was a lot of things I was excited about and I was sort of open to trying to negotiate with the things where it would be weaker and um, I, like I said I did really want it to make it work for lots of reasons and, and I'm happy to discuss those reasons. I mean my, the obvious one is the size, um, it's, it's such a small and compact um, uh, kit that it was, a, it was a breath of fresh air against the heavy heavy bags I was carrying. I mean now I can go on location shoots and I can bring put two bodies in a bag um, four or five lenses, two flashes, loads of batteries, and, and it's actually hand luggage. It's not even, you know, uh, like a big heavy kind of camera bag. I mean, sometimes you get these these sort of airport bags, and uh, there's still anxiety about them because they're heavier than they're really you're really allowed, and it's a bit tight sometimes. And you put a laptop in, it might not go in that little box that they give you to to drop it in at the airport. Where now I don't worry about anything of anything like this at all when I go on location overseas. Um, and I do a lot, you know, I think last year I had seven, seven or eight shoots aboard. Um, so it's enough to, 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 uh, to notice the difference. Um, but also the lenses. So there's a great range of lenses which I'm delighted to, to use. And, you know, I'm, I love the fact that I can work with a Panasonic Leica lens and the Voigtlander lenses. And a lot of the pictures coming up will be on both of them. Um, and of course the Olympus range are fantastic too. So there's a, there's a brilliant set of ranges of lenses which the, the system offers. Um, and I've, I now more often are using the M5 Mark II than the M1. I, I listened to actually Rob uh, Pugh, my um, ambassador colleague at Olympus talk when he did his recently last year, I think it was. And, and he said he doesn't use the M1 and, and I don't hardly use it either now. Um, and I just find that the M5 Mark II, that extra... Um, so he called it a stop. I would think it's more than a stop. I feel sometimes it's like two stops. I mean, I can hand hold um, at, at, at a sixteenth of a second, and it's sharp. I remember shooting a, a moon shot at like an eighth of a second, and it was sharp when the camera first came out. The image stabilizer is fantastic on it, um, and, uh, uh, and and obviously, you know, that makes such a big difference with all these amazingly fast lenses. Uh, so I find that um, I'm using the M5 all the time now in my work. Um, so I'm just going to move on from this. So I'm going to talk about my weddings now. Excuse me, just have some water. So 2009, I decided that I was going to. Uh, I was still teaching, and I was I was interested in you know my academic interest was still active, and I'd finished my PhD. But I was decided that I wanted to move back more into commercial practice, and I began to make this kind of conscious move from away from academic life back to commercial practice. And of course, I'd over the years, although I could, you could see this sort of artistic trajectory, but over the years I was still doing from time to time commercial work, uh, but there would be like far and few in between and so on. Um, to the big, big art projects that I was more interested in. And I started to move away from it. I became more interested in the rewards, obviously there's financial rewards, but also the, the kind of speed of, of 
reward, there's a kind of reward in, in time in shooting a commercial shoot where, where art projects take time, they take, can take months, and you embed yourself in the field or, you know, I'm developing a body of work which I think about and critique and then reshoot and so on, where to go in and shoot a wedding or to shoot an event or to do a, a lifestyle shoot and so on or an architecture shoot, you know, there's a tremendous technical rewards and commercial rewards and, and satisfaction over doing something over two or three days or four days producing a great body of work which I was then able to develop and put in a portfolio and exhibit um, in online I mean when I say exhibit and, uh, and obviously the financial benefit of it as well so I began to sort of move away from academic interests um, and, and move back towards the commercial practice and in 2009 I started to think about weddings and one of my colleagues um, I mentioned his name, Ian Southworth, who's um, Pear Tree Pictures, his, his wedding business. Um, he's a friend of mine, and he uh, he said at the time, John, I, I need. Um, I think it was 2008 actually. He said, I'm, I'm, he was a wedding photographer at this point, and and he said, look, I, I need a second shooter. Would you be interested in helping? And I said, well, I'm not a, I'm not a, a wedding photographer. And he said, well, look, it's not like that in these days. You know, it's documentary. You just, you know, I know you've just done refugee refugees in camps, it's documentary, you just you just photograph what's happening, you know, photograph kind of details and objects and people and, and I remember turning up and doing this shoot with him and I was so amazed having done all this sort of long term projects, just the satisfaction of doing something in one day and, and the day to be so joyous, having gone from, you know, kind of the intensities of these sort of political projects or socially engaged practices or, you know, the, the you know the hard, the hard actual experiences of shooting in refugee camps and so on, to then shooting a really joyous day, and um, and and also this whole thing about trust was is interesting. You know that when you're doing big field work projects like you know documentary projects, that it takes time to develop trust with your subjects. Where here, you know, there's a sort of instant trust that you sort of we're allowed we're allowed to be in people's faces. We're like I, I considered myself as an intimate stranger. Immediately, people accept us photographing them and we've never met them before, it's a really important day for them, but suddenly I can stand in their way while the speeches are taking place because I'm taking a picture and no one's getting asking me to move, I mean obviously it's rude to stay in the same place constantly so my practice is to constantly move about, but my point is that there was something like immediately um, allowable about this experience to shoot the whole day and it's such a joyous experience and I really enjoyed it and enjoyed the whole documentary approach for it. And I just began to think that this could be interest. I could be interested in this. Um, so I uh, I set up my brand, and um, at the moment now I have two brands. I don't know whether people come across this if they look me up, but I have um, my main brand is my me, which is John Lasari, But I also have a sister company called Indigo Images, and that's my team. So I've got two full-time employees. One of them is a photographer, and the other one is a videographer. But I've also got um, somewhere between four to six, I'd say, full-time freelancers that I would w work with regularly. Um, and um, uh, Indigo Images is, is that team. So sometimes I might, uh, particularly because I've got a full-time employee, so it's a business model. So, you know, I, I might get lots of inquiries for Indigo because Indigo has been now been quite busy for a long time, where I won't be shooting the Indigo weddings, my my team does, where my team will help and support me on my Nasari weddings, um, and it keeps them busy and it keeps them, keep pays for their salaries and so on. Um, so I kind of began to think about my wedding work, to really think about where I'd come from, so that sort of lighting interest about composition. Um, so I wanted to sort of bring in this sort of advertising part in it, although, as you saw in my earlier work, there was no people in it. Um, I, I really just thought about the kind of the, the impact, the kind of advertising approach, the grandeur, um, was something I wanted to appear in my work alongside the documentary, because I'd really developed the documentary and also had this advertising past and wanted to synthesize the two. Um, so a lot, a lot of my work is really, I'm trying to really sell the documentary but with this kind of this kind of advertising edge to it. I mean this picture, I, I love this picture, so this was shot in Salisbury in 2011 I think and I remember, it, I, this was my Canon days and I remember it was pouring down and I was walking with the couple and, 
they're walking in now to the um, reception, so the ceremony had taken place, and they left the ceremony, and that's the entrance to where the reception was. And all the guests had gone in, they were the last in the line, and everyone had run in, and they were at the back, and I was next to them, and I ran ahead of them, and thought I'd just get a shot of them, and I kept running, and kept running, I ran past the door, and past the car, and ran into under this tree, when you can see the kind of the bushes, and crouched down and waited for them to come in, and, and uh, I took this shot. This um this is an interesting shot and it's got a story to it because um when I took this picture uh, he kind of photo bombed this guy just dropped right right past really fast right right through through the moment of the confetti shot and uh, I remember shouting at the camera um, at him but I remember staying steady so I, I just had the kind of presence of mind to just keep shooting and he passed and then they were revealed. Um, and I got a shot at the end, but it was really this shot that I, I liked the most, and I showed the couple, and they really liked it as well, and laughed, and they called it, quote, typically Cambridge, and um, I remember uh, afterwards thinking, this shot is just amazing, this sort of trajectory, the journeys, these two different journeys of the wedding and this man, and kind of um, c colliding, and I, and I just like the metaphor of it, and I, um, I wondered who he was, and I thought, I'd like to enter this into competitions, and I thought, Maybe I'll try and find out who he is, and maybe I'll, I'll like a consent form, but I wonder what PR I can get from this as well. It's this kind of conscious thought about PR. So I, um, with, with the couple's permission, I contacted Cambridge News, because it was shot in Cambridge, and I said, can you help me find it? this man? We're not unhappy. We just want to know more about him and what's his story, and we want to find out what, where he's going. And um, they put it on their front page, and um, I think it was front page, but then within... Uh, within about two or three days, it went national, and it was in the Metro, I think it went Evening Standard. I was getting emails from professors at Harvard. It had gone viral, and people were like, there was lecturers emailing me saying that they'd seen it come up in a news feed, and they wanted to show it in a lecture, and about, about kind of um, trajectories and so on. I was, I was just like, wow, this is amazing. And then after a few days, he emailed, he called me up, he just called me, he got my number, and he called me and said, I'm your, I'm your mystery cyclist. And his name is Archie, and he was late for a physics exam. And uh, there's a way well, you know, one might call it a happy accident. So this is um, this is a shoot I did in 2014, which was in Monaco. So I began by around 2012. So quite quickly, I was doing begin began to do quite high-end weddings. Um, so I, I work at the Savoy quite a bit now, and I have a great relationship with the Mandarin Oriental. Um, and work with some top wedding planners as well. And also, I won't be able to show it here, but I've developed a, a what I call an innovative 360 interactive, which you can see on my website. So you can go to my website and see, go to 360. And these are kind of these sort of multimedia spaces, weddings which are opened up into 360 environments. And this is part of an environment. Um, actually, you won't see this 360 because the um, because of rights issues with the couple. This is one of my biggest ever weddings. This was in Monaco. And John Legend played at this wedding, actually. Um, this, is a, this is one of the, the evening shots um, from, from the evening. I had, I had seven people in my team on this shoot. So I had four photographers and three videographers. So we did the film, we did the photography, and also did a 360. And there's John Legend playing in the evening. But most of my work is in London, a lot of it, I'd say, sort of 80% of my weddings, I think, are in London, um, and a lot of my commercial practice is in London as well, so I, I, what I mean is my, my corporate work. I mean, in January, I've been very busy. I've had uh, two editorial portraits. I had a two-day shoot with a design agency photographing a lifestyle shoot. Uh, so I'm very busy. I'm very varied. I've got a food shoot next week. Um, so I'm very busy, and I'm happy to talk about how I managed to... Uh, to do that, actually. Uh, it's interesting because when I was at college, you came out with a focused portfolio. So, you know, you were a food photographer, or you were a news photographer, or you were a fashion photographer, or a portrait photographer, or in my case, a still life photographer. So that was what my book was. But I would argue now that I think photographers, if they really want to develop and and grow, a holistic approach is, is where to go. And I've tried to develop that. Of course, I don't do everything. Um, I don't. You know, I, well, my food photography is is quite tight. So often it will be uh, plates lit. Obviously, I've got my lighting background, so I, I can light food really well. Um, but it's not like you know daylight lights coming through with loads of props and 
stuff like that. It's more like product photography of food. So the chefs want really nice, sort of tight kind of product shots of their food, so stuff like that. Um, and I don't do car photography. I don't do high-end fashion, really. Um, you know, I might do a bit of fashion, maybe one or two shoots a year, but hardly anything to talk about. I do a bit of lifestyle, actually. So increasingly, I do a lot. Of, um, actually, I'm doing a lot more lifestyle. Uh, I do a lot of events, so wedding, separate from weddings. So these are like corporate events or evenings, and so on. And also, obviously, my portraiture too. This is a wedding in Santorini. Um, so here, I'm sh now beginning to um, show you some of my Voigtlander work. So this was a shot on a Voigtlander. Uh, it's a 25 mil Voigtlander lens. What I love about this lens is 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 its speed. So at 0.95. You know, you're talking about. I mean, it was it was it was dark to my eye. I mean, it was so dusk, but the, the lens just brings in all the light. It's just the way it just sees things at such fast aperture like that. Um, uh, and I've got a light actually on the bride's back, so I've got my assistant holding a light, which is lighting her back, kind of lifting it because obviously it was starting to drop down a bit. The sun is in front of them to their left, so the back was really dropping away. So I had a little fill-in using an, a um, LED light on the bride's back there. And this again is the Voigtlander 25mm. Um, I, I do like the Voigtlander for nighttime photography because it's so fast. And what you can do is in a, with, a, with this system is that you, what I do is I, um, I zoom in, focus on them, I peak focusing, so I'm getting a shimmy and I'm focusing on their, on their profile there. And then, because it's manual focus, I'm not worried about it moving or getting confused with the water coming down, so I know I'm fixed on them. I've got an assistant in front of them lighting them, so you can see that glow. And then I'm using available light elsewhere with the trees, and um, the fountain had its own lights and so on. And uh, yeah, so that was that shot. Um, what I try and do is when I photograph couples, I want I want to try and sell a kind of documentary approach, but at the same time, when you do couple photography, it's it's hard to make it, you know, it's couple photography. You're dealing with couples and you set up. So I try and make moments. So I try and kind of shoot over things, a voyeuristic kind of approach, this sort of this idea of you catching a moment, even though it's set up. Um, I'm here, I've got the, the groom to come in and kiss her. He, he did it a couple of times. He sort of walked from the left to the right in one motion and took her hand and kissed her. Um, and this is, this is a Voigtland as well. What I really like about the... the I mean, in the old days, I'd be lying on the ground, flat on the stomach, trying to peer through the viewfinder, but now I can just sort of lift the screen up and just hold, I held the camera almost to get two inches from the water. And because the screen was sort of flicked upwards, I could see what I was looking at, focus manually, peak focus. I zoomed in, peak focusing again, focused on the veil and the shimmy of it, and I knew it was fixed, and then I zoomed back out and I waited for the wind. Uh, again, it was set up, obviously. Here's a bit of groom photography. Uh, I do think grooms get missed out sometimes, and um, they're great fun working with the guys. And uh, this is this, this was in, um, it's in the WPJA, it won an award actually. Um, and uh, it, this is a kind of a mixture of um, of, a, of a moment caught, but also a moment set up. So there was discussion about a bath, of course. I didn't just walk in and catch it. So it was something we knowingly did, but it was also something that we that they wanted to do, so they just had this sort of idea that they wanted to do it, and and I was keen for it as well. So we kind of set it up and and uh, tried to make it kind of natural. So he's in, he's you know he's got his best man in the mirror, and he's like having a little kind of rest and a nap. Um, and again, uh, this is one of my early groom shots, which I um, I still love. This is Nick. I'm not sure Nick might be here tonight. I know he said he was going to. Um, Nick's now a photographer, and uh, he. Um, uh, this is what I like about this picture. A lot of people are uh, question this image about what's going on because this is actually before the bride comes down the aisle, his bride, but he's actually wearing a ring, but it's an engagement ring, I think. So people sometimes think that he's just got married and he's like, oh my God, what have I done? And I, I you know, and people like respond to that. Um, and I, and I think Nick could say to you that I asked him to do that, but I think um, I think I, I don't remember asking him to do it, but um, I remember asking him to take a moment. And, uh, and this, this kind of great moment came came up between us. I always think it's a relationship when you when you take um, portraits of people. Um, here's a here's a dance picture um, which I really like as well. This is uh, it took last last May in Luton Hoo. And what I really like about this picture is a few things. I mean, I'm 
using the fisheye, the Sam Young, uh, I really like the fact the energy of the image, the fact that he's touching the ceiling. Um, and I'm in the picture, there's a shadow of me top left, and I'm sort of hand holding it. So I'm not even looking through the viewfinder on it, I'm just sort of just using the live view. Um, and these little moments, so if I can get a real moment, a little moment, you know, I, that's why I enjoy the most about my work, the kind of doc, the documentary moments which just pass so by so fast, which, uh, you know, the cyclist and so on, those, those moments are what I enjoy the most. And, you know, if it means I slightly move slightly to get a better frame, I will, uh, but I'd rather try and just capture it as it happens rather than intervene or, or get in the way. And this is another example. I just saw them kiss. This is a really big wedding of mine last year. It was in November in, 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 um, in the V&A, in the Raphael Gallery. And it was a, it was, um, it was a, a big, it was a tough wedding, this. It was, it was planned by Bruce Russell. And, um, again, I had, I think I had eight people in my team on this, four photographers, four videographers. And um, it was a massive shoot. Uh, and the size wasn't that it was about I think about 280 guests I think um, but it was more the pressure you know we had like 10 minutes to shoot the room um, there were heads of state there was a lot of VIPs and so on it was um, a high pressure to shoot and there was just, just this moment during dinner where they I was behind them we were just talking with my team about you know our next shots coming up and what we're doing and waiting for speeches and they just turned and kissed and I just grabbed my colleague and said light them because obviously from behind it wasn't lit like that and he just stuck the, the light on and I just caught it while they kissed. And of course this is a captured moment. Um, I love this relationship between the three figures, uh, particularly the, the little girl. I think she's wonderful in this picture. And this too, you know, um, it's one of my favourite ceremony pictures. She, you know, the bride comes up the aisle with, the, with her father and the groom turns to see her and he breaks down in emotion and puts his hand over his mouth and you've got, you've got these echoes of hands, you've got like the best man with his hand on the groom's shoulder and then the, um, the you know, the, the, the groom with his hand on his mouth and then the hands of the registrar, it's sort of this circle of hands and, and laughter, I love this, I do love this picture. Um, I'm going to move through some of my other work, so I'm aware that um, we're moving on, we need some time for questions. I mean, Jay, did you want to pause for questions at this point or shall I? Just keep going. I think I think knowing where we're at, um, uh, I think we'll we'll crack on because I know we're there, and uh, most of the questions are kind of generic overall questions. So okay, we'll allow the time. So yeah, you keep going, okay. but okay, no problem. So um, my portraits. I wanted to show you these portraits, and Now they've all got one thing in common, in terms of the way I, not that one, okay, I'm going back again. So I wonder if people notice what it is. So they've all got one thing in common, in terms of the way I've lit them. I wonder if anyone notices it. What is it? How did I light them? Any thoughts, Jay? Anything come in? Uh, I'm, I'm poised. Nothing yet. I know the answer, so that's cheating. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, here we go. Uh, reflected natural light. Yeah, they've got it. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I love portraiture like this. I've been very influenced by Avedon's approach. Um, obviously, I'm much tighter than a lot of his work, although he does do a lot of tight stuff. But um, I've got background outside, uh, north light. I'm using, obviously, the light above them it's sort of lighting their hair, and that kind of almost clips the top of their hair, you see the sort of way it does that, um, and the, the foreheads and stuff, you see on the top, and then, so they're kind of faced away from the light, and then the reflector then lifts them quite considerably, lifts the face and under their chin, and you see it here as well, this is all shot outside, with, and you see the, see the kind of highlights on the top of her hair there, um, uh, with the reflector, and I just love this sort of lighting, and the thing is that with film actually, um, it's sometimes a bit struggle. If I was shooting a 100 ISO film or 200 ISO film, I might struggle. But, but with these digital SR cameras, you know, I could put it on 800 or 1,000. And with these amazingly fast lenses, a, a lot of these are, some of these, this, this is the Voigtlander 45. So this is an 42.5, the Voigtlander, which turns it into an 85. Um, so it's very fast lenses. Um, this is the 85mm Canon. So this is my Canon days. That is the... Leica 42.5, uh, 
um, the uh, Micro Four Thirds system. Um, so, and that is the Canon 85mm uh, 1.2. I can't remember what F number. Uh, so I'm using 85 mils or 42.5 and a Micro Four Thirds and a mixture between Void Lander, um, the Leica Panasonic Leica, and in the Canon days is the uh, is the Canon 85 mil. This is a family portrait. This was um, shortlisted for the 32nd uh, AOP award last year, which uh, um, I exhibited in. And this is a comp. So this is a, I'm back to comps. So I did this last year, and this is a, I call it this the family barbecue. It's my family, and I really wanted to sort of explore this sort of, you know, just but you know we all have these barbecues, don't we? Well. Not everyone, but um, I always kind of think that when I have our when we have our barbecue, sometimes there's this sort of dysfunction about f the family, and I'm sure lots of people share this view. But I wanted to explore this with my with my own family, like this idea of a dis of a disconnect between everybody, um, and so I actually shot it in a way to create that disconnect. So you know, the 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 the, the two kids was one photo, so they're all cleaning bikes. That was one picture, and my sister was in the middle in the wheelchair and I asked her to lift her chair up and fade back, lean back and almost like she's sunbathing. And then my mum in the, in the wheelchair to the right of her, that's a separate picture uh, and so on and so on. So almost like these people were, you know, sort of um, uh, taking these different spaces but disconnected from everybody and then connect, and all drawn back in together through the comping. And even the dog was a separate picture. Um, so it's intriguing. Uh, there's something about it that is interesting. The light is unusual. You know, normally it I'd kind of want much softer light, you know, it's a bit heavy and, you know, very contrasty and bright and sort of added to it. So it's sort of uh, it's an eerie image, I think. This is a shot of my son, and this is uh, a Voigtlander 25mm again. Um, this was one morning, he was waiting for pancakes, and the light came through the window and streamed through, and I just loved this light on him, and I went and grabbed my camera and photographed it, and uh, I entered this for the Taylor Westing. I didn't get in with it, but I really love the print as well, how it came out. Here's a few of some celebrity portraiture. Um, this is Rusty, Sam Rusty, um, and uh, uh, Ottoman Kimengi, and um, uh, celebrity chef, Israeli chef, and um, uh, um, Kevin McLeod. So these are jobs mostly. Um, this was a, uh, a small job for Reba. Um, it was a sort of PR campaign, and we did a shoot on the underground, obviously. Um, Permits and so on are complicated and things like this. There was a massive design agency behind us and, and art directors and so on. Uh, this is a PR shoot of Media Fox, um, and these are these are portraits shot at an event, um, a stylist live event last year. And this is a, a portrait of a photographer, Alistair Morrison. So here I'm moving into some interiors. Um, the first three shots are my interior work. From 2010, uh, this is an 11, stroke 11. So at that point, I was the roster photographer for Ward of Astoria. So I was actually being flown around the world photographing luxury hotels before they opened. And I'd spend a week there with my team, shooting very kind of advertising, large for well not large format, but uh, digital SLR, but with um, tilt and shift lenses. Um, and I still do a lot of interiors, but my approach has changed. So this, these first three are um, tilt and shift. This is the Scion Park Hotel in West London. And the, the lights behind those uh, um, chairs are flashes, wireless flashes, um, all synced and connected. And then my, my approach has changed. So now from here on in is a set of interior shots on the 17mm uh, Voigtlander. So I began now, I've started to shoot interiors of my Olympus. Um, and if I do need to hire a kit, I will. So, you know, if I need a Hasselblad or if I need the Olymp you know, a tilt and shift system, I'd use it. But here the client, this is uh, the Dijagra Hotel in um, Morocco and Marrakesh. And uh, uh, Lucy Silva, the owner and stylist and art director, we worked with her very closely. She wanted a kind of rich, sort of um, uh, a romantic kind of quality. And I just felt that, 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 this sort of is too modern and clean and so on, this system, and there's something really warm about the Voigtlander um, approach, which uh, is, brings out a kind of richness, and certainly the, 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 
the focus, you know, the um, the broker, uh, and the way the fall off and so on. So there's a kind of really, you know, the way the depth of field works on it. So there's a kind of a uh, elegance and luxury and richness about about the images. And and the thing is, you can then hand hold it, um, so it's, you sort of move a bit faster. It feels a bit quicker. It's more organic. You know, instead of one picture every 45 minutes or an hour, you know, I can move much faster around and and hand hold in at times. I mean, sometimes I don't, and I tether. Um, this was actually tethered to a laptop, so we have a look and discuss it, and move things around, and tweak things, and add some light, and so on. You know, so there's a lot of lot of um, playing. You know, we want it to look natural, but actually, there's a lot of filling in places to uh, to bring out, you know, bring out the shadows. And this was um, this was just natural light coming in, bright sunlight, Voigtlander again. These are all Voigtlanders. Um, this is again the 17 mil. So I think it's interesting because I don't think people would associate the Voigtlander system with with architecture, um, but I really feel that there's a you know it works really well for portraiture and couple shoots and night photography, um, but also for for room photography and, and details and so on. Again, Voigtlander. So a night photo Voigtlander on a tripod tethered. So there's a kind of warmness about, about, about this lens, I think. So I'm going to end showing you this final project. So this is a, a personal project. This is uh, called Alters. I've been doing this for two years. I've done about 30 now, maybe 35. Um, and these are, are basically portraits about alter egos. So again, I'm kind of finding myself comping again. I don't know why it's such a part of my work in 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 my personal work as well, you know, more than my um, commercial work, actually, much more my personal work. Um, you know, I don't comp on weddings or anything like that. It's impossible, or events or anything like that. Uh, even lifestyle shoots, you just can't. There's no time for those sorts of things. Uh, but I find in my art practice, my personal work, there's a lot of it. So this is these are actually all one person. So I photograph them once. So they basically tell me who their alter ego is. So they name them. So we start with James. So James tells me his alter ego is called Lee, and Lee is the one on the left with the dog on his arm, looking sideways, the, the, the bearded one. So Lee is the bearded one, and he's looking at James, and James is looking at us. And um, he had, a, you know, everyone's got to have a story about who their alter ego is, and do they get on, and what do they look like. And obviously, he shaved in between the shoots, so in between the shots. So, you know, we started with Lee, and we shot him, and the dog was on, looking. And then you know he went and shaved and came back and dressed in a suit. Um, so you know, are, you know, when you first looked at them, you know, are they twins? Are they are they are they sisters, brothers? Um, but actually, they're the same person. I really kind of wanted this to explore personal identity, really, and a shifting identity. I mean, they're called alters, but are they? You know, sometimes actually these people exist. You know, sometimes they're more dramatic, like this one. But um, sometimes they. You know, they're people that exist in the in their lives, and it's not a construction. It's actually parts. Of, you know, the the woman on the left, the one in the red. You know, is she comes out sometimes, and the one in the blue comes out other times, and so on. You know, so actually people end up constructing their own kind of versions of themselves. This is a bit more dramatic. She's an actress, and she really kind of was at playing up this sort of differences between them. It's quite interesting, quite dramatic. Um, um, and again, this is uh, Lola, and she um, created a alter ego, which is about something she exists. So she's a singer on a yacht, on on on, on yachts, actually, yeah, on liners, cruise ships, and sh on on in the lower cabin, she's the one on the left, and when she's on stage, she's the one on the right. Um, and she just wanted to sort of explore that, those different parts of herself. And we kind of tried to create a bit of a kind of an ocean, you know, a sea narrative, you know, I, I shot this at Farley's prop hire, so we kind of were going through stuff and taking bits and props and so on to light, to um, to add to the set, to kind of um, add to the story. Um, but here, here I'm going to show you how I did it. So, we know they're comps, but actually, I, I'm in these pictures, so what I've tried to do is I'm using my Olympus app on my phone, camera's on a tripod, um, I'm using my phone to take the picture, so it's a remote control, and I'm placing myself in the picture. And that way, that's why these aren't act I mean, there was one actress or two actresses, or you know, the odd actor here or there. But most of these people aren't aren't actor actors, and they're just they're just captured by you know the project and want to try it. Um, 
so what James is looking at is me. So I'm there actually, and I've got a dog biscuit on my lap, and I'm holding it for Archie, the dog, who's looking at me. And then we swap positions, and I hold the dog biscuit again. That's why he's kind of stepping up to try and grab it off me. So in the picture, he's almost an inch away from it. Um, and then obviously I cut myself out and place the other version of the person into it. So that's why eye levels work so well because actually they're looking at me. You know, these aren't people who are just pretending to be, you know, to act against nothing. They're acting against me. Um, so they were kind of responding to me, and I'd sit there and say, you know, or, you know, I'd play the role. You know, if they don't like them or so on, you know, they don't like their alter or they're envious of them or they're laughing at them. You know, then in the kind of they kind of respond to me. Um, so that's my work. I know that was a lot to take in. Um, and I've just given us about 10 minutes if there are more questions. Um, I just want to end by telling you a little bit about a future project I'm doing, which is a big project. Um, I've been working with the Mandarin Oriental Hyde Park London uh, for about 10 months, nine months, since May last year. Um, and I'm doing a, um, a, a documentary photography project. And I've been staying at a hotel um, at least two times a month, I think. Um, it's kind of staggered, you know, sometimes I might not stay for a few weeks and then I might stay for two nights and then two nights and so on. And I'm photographing all the staff in a, uh, a project which is to celebrate Olympus's 80th birthday of Olympus cameras. So it's 80, So this year, Olympus have been making cameras for 80 years and the project celebrates that with 80 photographs to celebrate 80 years of Olympus cameras. Um, and it's very, very documentary. So I've been staying in and around the hotel photographing just staff, not guests. I'm having a book launch in April and an exhibition in May at the Olympus Gallery in Bermondsey, which I'm sure Jay will pass on more information about when we've got um, when we've got the dates and so on, and it's all very clear when when it is. Um, so yeah, over to you, Jay. Brilliant, John. Thank you so much, mate. And uh, what a fantastic insight to well, 25 years. It seemed like it's flown by, mate. And 25, <laughs> 25 more years to come, I'm sure. I do have a load of questions for you. Uh, they're okay. not going to be any any particular order. But what I will do, though, John, is I'll rob yeah. the screen back so we can carry on sharing Fine. your links with with the guys. Um, okay. So as I said, I'm going to run these through, not in any particular order, mate, because uh, we've got because you've such a varied body of work. Some of them about your wedding, some of them about your cameras, yeah. some of them about your personal sure. stuff. So, uh, so okay. I'm just going to go down the list, mate. So, okay. What's uh, what was your? Have you had a most challenging wedding, or what's the most challenging aspect of a wedding for you, John? I think the most challenging wedding is the, there's, there's two that I showed you. So the one was in Monaco with John Legend shoot the wedding. And the one at the V&A, um, which was in November last year, uh, just because of the scale of it and the, the, the you know the amount of people in my team, um, and you know just the, the how tight it is in terms of the schedule, um, and working with top top suppliers and everyone's expecting you know absolute top work because everyone wants the, the couple do you know all the suppliers want to see that too you know the expectation um, and you know it's actually it's it's, it's thrilling, but it's challenging. You know, it's not one of these really kind of like, you know, shooting a barn somewhere, and it's just everyone's having a great time, and I'm just like loosely walking around, getting great shots, and I know that whatever I do, they're going to be delighted. The, the, you know, the, the pressure's kind of heightened, and and that, and that's um, that makes it um, rewarding, but uh, challenging. And I think that for that, for the, for those sorts of weddings, I think that's where I'd say that the, the challenges are with my big teams and high end things like that. Uh, brilliant, bud. Uh, okay, so this I thought this was quite a nice question, really. Um, so I'm looking to move myself up to the program uh, from being an amateur, but I'm afraid. Do you have any good advice? Could you just say that again? Can yeah, sorry. So, um, so I'm looking to move myself up as a photographer to a, as a, to, to a pro. Um, mm. So I'm, I'm obviously working away hard at being an amateur at the moment, but my problem is my fear. So any tips of getting over the fear? What's the what's the next step for for the the guy oh, to wow. Well, I'd love to know what the fear, what, you know, what does that mean, the fear, the, which, because there's so many different elements, so you, there's the kind of technical things and there's the client relationships and, you know, what area of photography are we talking about? Um, so I'd maybe, you know, I'd be interested to learn more about that. Maybe that, the, the person could email me. I'm happy to, to, um, to talk a bit more about that. Um, I always say what's been the grounding of me was my education. And I think in this, this era, it's so different in the digital era where people, you know, 
uh, and, and people do, you know, decide they want a career change and they leave their jobs and they get five to ten grand's worth of kit and they maybe do some online research and so on and maybe it's a couple of courses here and there and um, and they enter into practice and I really felt the grounding of those years of, of, of practicing, of being around other people, practicing, have, developing in, a, in an academic context or, well, I call it a pra practice-based context. Um, it was really the grounding of me, and I think that that's um, something I'd never forget. And I, and I draw on that sometimes when I'm and I'm challenged in shoots, and I just think about the resource that I've had and the experiences I've had, and I kind of try and find a solution if things are tricky in, in a shoot, um, technical or otherwise. Um, so I think that's that's um, you know courses and education. I think is what is, is a is a good advice to help you. Brilliant. Um, I'm going to ask. Oh, I, I, I t uh, this was a question that I knew I had in advance, and I, and I did sort of uh, prime you earlier, but you answered it straight away. So, do you have a standout moment in the 25 years so far, John? Um, I suppose. I mean, it's quite varied, isn't it? Because I've got my academic career, my, you know, my um, my personal work, and my weddings, and so on. Um, but I think if I had to pick. It, I mean, it would be the three moments I was in the National Portrait Gallery. Those, those three, those three photos that were selected for the Taylor Wessing. Um, the Dad and Me was the first one, and that was a great, great experience to see my work in the gallery. And then, the, the following two. I think I think I'd have to say those, those, you know, being in that in the gallery. No, oh, I get that completely, bud. Completely. Yeah. Uh, excellent. Uh, okay, let's have a chat quickly about the move to Olympus and and the four thirds cameras. Um, so I've actually had a couple of quite distinctive uh, techie questions. So let's get mm -hmm. them out, out of the way. Um, what's your What are you comfortable with photographing a wedding at the highest ISO on the Olympus at a wedding with John? That's a very very good question. I was struck by Rob's. I don't know if everyone anyone's listened to Rob's, but you should. Um, and I was struck to how sort of regimented he, he is about how he shoots the wedding and he said that you know at certain points here he used a card at certain points and then it's took you know so he used a card for prep and it would only be on certain ISO at certain points and if it's a cloudy day he would be on 400 or 800 or I can't remember what he said um, I, I just I find that I, 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 I'm not like that I'd love to be like that but I'm not and I also find that sometimes I'm in such bad lighting conditions that I can't do that. I wish I could. I mean, if I was shooting in Australia with loads of light, then I could. But sometimes, even with my Voigtlander lens at 0.95, I'm struggling. So I will probably. I I don't like to go over 1600 ISO. Um, there it is. So yeah, if I have to, I go to that. Um, but I'd rather not. But I will if I know if I if I need to. Excellent. Um, this is quite. Do you know what? This has come up a few times, especially when we started looking at the the sort of four third cameras. Um, yeah. Why why switch to the four third camera? I know you've talked about uh, obviously the decision when you changed your kit. That was obviously, and this question actually came through before you talked about your kit choices and when you change formats. Uh, but mm. there's this is the the second part of the question was what interested me because we get this a lot. Um, doesn't this stop you now from producing large wall prints? Was basically was the question. No, I don't think so. Um, I you know, I do the quintessential wedding show, and I always show. It depends what you mean by large wall prints. So, you know, you I you can print 40 inches, um, and I've got 40 inch prints in frames shot on my Olympus kit, uh, with you know a mixture of lens, Leica lenses or the Olympus lenses and the Voigtlander lenses. So you you know I feel you can print, you know, bet probably maybe 30, 35 inch, 36 inches, something like that. Um, and I'm not worried. I'm not. And this is from someone that's come out of advertising. Um, and I bought, I've also bought a five by four camera recently. So, you know, I'm going to now use that probably for my um, portrait competition entries. So I'm just going to try and go back into film. And I really enjoyed this experience. I did a test a couple of months ago, and my heart was pounding. I hadn't used one in 15 years. And I was, I was like, wow, this is amazing. I haven't felt this way about taking a photograph for ages. And I remember I, I spent an hour and took four pictures, and because it just took so slow, and um, I was photographing my son again. He was totally bored, um, but I was like thinking, you know, this is a great kind of combination to be able to turn to this and do this personal work. So I can do big wall art prints like that. I've got, you know, other. You can always hire kit. You can. I can always use my five by four. But I find that. For my commercial practice, they're not going to, you know, who's going to be doing a, if they, if a client says, 
you know, it's a billboard, it's a bus poster, it's you know, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, something big like that. Then I, I might consider another um, body for that shoot, and that's fine. Um, but you know, I always discuss where it's going with the client, and I've got, I've got a shoot coming up, and and it's going to be in a magazine. And I'm shooting with Olympus without without question. So I'm, I'm not worried. We just we we've actually got a 60 inch print here in our gallery, um, which was done on a four third camera. It wasn't the Olympus, so I'm not going to uh, say. Right. But but it, but the equivalent, and uh, you would you wouldn't yeah. know. It's it's absolutely yeah. stunning, stunning image. So I think yeah. the perceptions are changing, and I think you just need to have a look at those images. And uh, as we've seen tonight, especially you know uh, the stuff that you've talked. You know, I, I think maybe as, as well we need to just clarify when you were referring to the Voigtlander. Just a few people have mentioned that. Is that the camera? No, the camera is the Olympus, and the lens yes. is the Voigtlander. Um, yes. so, you know so those images that John has shared with you tonight. Uh, you know when he started shooting with the with the uh, Olympus, uh, as strong as anything you can see coming off a DSLR today. So um, yeah. the, the technology is changing every day, John, as we've already discussed yeah. you in, our, in the past. Uh, yeah. Brilliant. This was a nice question. I liked. Uh, I'm getting into wedding photography. Um, so you've talked a lot about lenses. I haven't got loads of money. What's my go-to lens I should buy for a wedding? Oh, well, that's a great question. Just one lens, Jay. Just the one lens to start with. You can give us a second oh. one if they can budget and stretch. But what's their one go-to lens? All right. If it's if we can have two lenses, I'd say the thirty. Okay, full frame, thirty-five and eighty-five, and the micro four thirds that'd be seventeen and the forty-two point five. I think I think you could shoot a wedding with those two lenses. All right, I give it's you that. Just just one lens. Oh God. So I'd go to seventeen if I had to, because then. It's more like a street photography, you know. You've got a kind of a wide, slightly wider, you know. You've got your, your um, 17 mil, which is 30, your 35. I'd go for that, 17.5. And that's kind of bearing in mind your your sort of documentary approach to to weddings yeah, as well, exactly. isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Good. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Um, we obviously unlucky. Uh, we did do a test, guys. So a couple of questions came through about the 360 format that John does, um, and we did do a test to see if we could show that off on the webinar. But unfortunately, the webinar software just couldn't cope with it. So John yeah. mentioned to go to his website and have a look at the 360 section. Uh, John, do yeah. you use any particular camera for that? Any special requirements for, for Actually, making those images? I, well, I obviously need a 360 head, so I have um, a special head which it. Uh, and I normally use my EM5 Mark One, which I don't use for anything else anymore. Um, and the thing, the reason is that if I'm going to do a 360, it's digital. It's a digital experience. You're scrolling around them. It's not a print, so it's screen-based. So I'm not worried about using my EM5 Mark One. It's obviously it's not as good as the EM5 Mark Two, but we're talking about a screen image here. So that's why I use it. I dig it out. It doesn't even come out as a backup anymore, so I only dig that one out when I'm doing my 360, and I put it on permanently, so it just sits there all day, and it's all calibrated, so I don't have to keep swapping cameras, because it takes whilst to calibrate the 360 head. So I calibrate it in the morning, get it ready, and then I just dig that out and use it. And then it's done in sections, so it's it's rotation. Uh, my my really my friend um, Guy Melandri, who's a great photographer, you know, has really pioneered this work, and I've worked with him a lot. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm now doing it myself in weddings, particularly. Um, and and you, you, it's, it's basically a rotation of about 15, 16 pictures, depending on how you set up the um, the head, and then you stitch it together. Well, we, you and I have discussed the the possibility of doing some film together this year, so maybe that's something we should look at if you're up for it. Is uh, yeah, absolutely. We, we do something yeah. based on the 360 shoot, and we can come along and see how it's done, and then we can show them how the put yeah. it together after. That'd be great, mate. Absolutely, uh, yeah, I'd be delighted to do that. Excellent. Um, where I'm, uh, just make sure I've lost my place. Okay, so um, it was interesting. A couple of questions came through about the weddings. Um, um, obviously, you're talking about that you've been very fortunate enough with with the work and the way your career has progressed. That you've you've been able to do the higher end. Um, yeah. Has there been a what's the best way to sort of get these relationships? Is it with the venues rather than anything else, or the wedding planners? Are they the the, the relationships to build, John? Um, I think it's multiple. I think it's with people, definitely. Um, and, those, and those people are sit in different places. So um, sometimes there's like London networks. I found has been a great way at the beginning to get to know everybody through different agencies and associations. NAWP is one um, where you get to meet a lot of suppliers and so on. Um, obviously, you know you need you need some good work. You need you need you need a couple of breaks to have to get some good venues and so on to so have something to start with to show. Um, and then obviously then meeting venues, 
Trainees are tricky because you know, sometimes you know they've got a set of lists and suppliers who they they prefer, and then they might have these rules about you know we know we don't relook really at that for another two years and things like this. And they, I hear, um, and I'm I mean I'm with a few venues and um, and, and often venues will be quite varied, you know. So there might be four or five photographers, or you know. Yeah, four or five photographers, quite a varied range of people at different price points, you know, so they want to offer different options. Um, so, but, so I would say a whole range of things, venues, planners, networks, wedding networks, and obviously social media. I've got PR, so I have a PR agency representing me, um, and I've noticed that's helped me a lot since I've been with them now for two and a half years, I think it is. Um, and, you know, I haven't got time to go through my weddings and choose pictures to send to magazines. Um, so you know they would look at my work and they would select them. They know what the magazines like. They'd send it them, and so on. So I've gone down that route as well. Uh, brilliant. We've got the last couple of questions, and then a few things that I want to share with you actually that have come through from the audience tonight. Um, so I, my last two questions, really. Um, if you had to tell your younger self anything, what would it be? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Um, depends how younger. Um, well, let's, base, we it, let's a, base it on the photography terms rather than, you know, your 15-year-old, 16-year-old. Yeah, 16 -year -old yeah I mean, were you we saying like the 91, you know, when I started in 91? Yeah, I guess. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, I had a lot of regret back those days about um, thinking that I'd made a mistake leaving advertising um, and moving into the, to the art world and, you know, that kind of first five years of it. Um, and I think I'd just say to myself to not, to not feel so regretful about it. Um, because I just felt once I was out, I was out. I don't do anything like that now, um, and uh, and I, uh, and I think that I'd probably go back and say, you know, it'll be all right. Don't worry. You know, I'll probably say that. Excellent. Well, I know you've told us a few things that you've got going on. What I think is really interesting that uh, I learned from the the, uh, the chats that you and I have been having behind the scenes over the last couple of weeks, and um, uh, and again, we've only ever chatted online. We haven't met in person yet, so I'm looking forward to that. But I love the yeah. fact that you've always, even though you've had the, the fortunate, well, the, the part of your career has been your academic, you've never yeah. left your personal projects. You're a wedding photographer. You're a commercial photographer but you've constantly carried on with your personal projects, whether they be for an exhibition or an art piece. And I think that's important, isn't it, John? It's important to keep your passion and your love of photography alive in these ways, isn't it? I totally agree. And it's, 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 you know, it's not a job. It's, it's a lifestyle. It's, um, it's a love. It's a passion, you know, since I was 13. And, and I think if, if I didn't do my personal work um, and I was just doing commercial work constantly, um, I just can't imagine a world like that for me. Because you know, I, I get. I mean, it, it means that I'm constantly working, even when I'm supposed to be off. I'm, you know, finding, I'm doing, or setting up shoots when I, sh you know, should maybe take some time off. But um, I, I, I think it feeds into my practice. It, it, it kind of renews me, you know, generates me, and so on. And um, and obviously, I get reward if you know if things end up exhibited or. Um, in exhibitions and so on, so I just think it kind of is a really important part of my of my practice to my personal work, and I don't think I'll ever stop it. Oh, that's brilliant. I mean, here at the Photographer Academy, there's you know there's four of us, and we push each other all the time to carry on with our own. So it's so easy to get stuck and tunnelled into what you yeah, do Monday to Friday, and and then on the weekend you might not want to do it, but we we constantly push each other, and then like I said, for those just even to create the image for yourself, if somebody else goes, that's fantastic, that's awesome, I love it. Oh, can I, you know. Really? It's just finding a way to fit it in, you know, like on Sunday I've got my friends coming over for lunch and it's family lunch and so on and um, and I, I've asked if I mind if I can photograph his daughter, she's about nine and um, we're all going to go to the woods so I'm going to bring my 5.4 camera and just, just half an hour, just do a few sheets and then go back and carry on having lunch and she's really excited about it, you know, I want to keep practicing more on my 5.4 um, and uh, yeah, so it's just about trying to fit it in, not being too critical about it as well and just doing it and seeing what happens and letting it grow, you know. I have to ask this question. So we've talked yeah. about, uh, it's the last question before I want to share some things with you, but um, we've talked about the 25 years. What's the next 25 years, John? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, hmm, 25 years, my goodness. The next 25 years. Um, I think I'd like to be in a situation where I may be doing five weddings a year. Maybe at the moment I'm, Doing around 15, um, some t you know, in recent years 20, 25. So I'd like to get to a point where I'm, sh I'm maybe just doing five, because I find them very difficult. 
it's interesting. I mean, in terms of energy, I mean, when I say difficult, um, uh, you know, the, they they represent a small part of my shooting, um, but they actually become a big part of my overall income because of you know the fees in weddings are, are you know vastly different from say a editorial portrait, you know, or even an interior shoot or um, a product photography and so on. So um, and, and that's understandably because they're so high-end pressured events and so on. Um, but I'd probably like to get to a point where I'm maybe just doing five to eight of those a year. Um, so I'm halving that um, and then um, really doing, you know, getting paid for doing really beautiful personal projects. So like this Mandarin project, you know, maybe doing more book projects like this over the next 25 years. Um, so maybe, you know, like one or one big project a year which I get my teeth into and... Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, something like that. I think sounds good, mate. Well, let's say like in 25 years' time, then whatever the uh, will probably be in people will probably be in people's homes via holograms, and you and I will be yes. sat, sat around the same table with them, chatting to them. But let's we'll put that in the look forward to that. we'll put that in the diary, yeah. mate, that we do this again right. in 25 years with whatever format uh, is available. Then, uh, John, we've had Brilliant. loads of uh, feedback uh, thanking you for tonight, but uh, two that I've kept. There's been loads though, mate. So, but two that I've Thank kept you. that I really wanted to share with you. Uh, one was what this is the first what an absolute treat. Such uh, diversity and talent. One of the most enjoyable and interesting webinars that we've done. So thank you, uh, John, That's and lovely. the Academy thank for putting it on. Um, brilliant webinar. Kept me hooked for the whole time. Uh, what an interesting guy. John is inspiring. Thanks so much. And then just come through now. Uh, you are so right about working too hard. I need to get my teeth into some personal stuff and refuel my love for photography. So, uh, you know, if nothing else, we've definitely done, well, you've done the work, John, but we've done our jobs tonight because, uh, well, 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 it's flooding through now, mate. So we could oh, be here for a long time. Um, thank you from me uh, here at the Photography well, Academy. Uh, we've chatted behind the scenes about hopefully doing some film together this year to show, to show them the behind the scenes. Uh, yeah. of, of what it's like to be John Nazari. Um, so, so that'll be good. And I think we definitely get, well, you and I make plans for that 360 project. Mm -hmm.